Yes, so um, again, welcome everyone to the council of members meeting. And I wanna take a moment uh, that we take this time to acknowledge the lands we all stand on today, have been called home by the indigenous people of the Salish Sea since time immemorial. We recognize tribal sovereignty and that this place holds special spiritual, cultural, and personal significance for Indian tribes and First Nations. And we acknowledge our responsibility to lift the voices of our tribal brothers and sisters in our life and to work to find justice and belonging in all we do. Important words. Yeah, I think just a little a little context before we introduce our speakers. I think we all know that in order to meet our mission, we need more people working together on things we agree on. And if there are areas where we're not all on the same page, then we ought to be discussing solutions that work for everyone, including uh, the salmon. Uh, so, of course, these discussions need to be informed by science and our community's values. And so we can effectively weigh benefits and impacts. The dialogue is where that all starts. So out of these concepts, is, uh, the board was born the Skagit Salmon Science Series by the board of directors. The board has tasked us with starting from the beginning to share the state of knowledge of salmon recovery in the watershed to support that dialogue moving forward from our first 20 years of actions that are behind us um, into our next 20 years of actions in front of us and making sure we're doing the right things in the right places is supported by as many people as possible, hopefully everyone. The questions we're gonna be asking and answering are who's responsible for what pieces of the puzzle and how do all those pieces fit together? So as we share this information in this forum, we wanna start broadening our circle to gather and hopefully address the community's questions and concerns. Our hope is that we can come meet you and your circle where you are in whatever format you need and um, to really have a two-way dialogue about where we are in salmon recovery. So today we'll be starting with uh, the Skagit salmon and their management context. Uh, the co-managers will be presenting um, because we hear a lot of questions about um, how fish are managed and the complexities of that process. Uh, at our next meeting, March 16th, we're gonna get back to Skagit Chinook and the recovery planning under the Endangered Species Act and how it's being implemented. Uh, future presentations will cover more specific habitat progress and effectiveness reports in areas like the estuary and freshwater domains. Thanks, Richard. And um, we're gonna start off with Bob McClure, who's the harvest management biologist with the Upper Skagit Indian Tribe. And then Casey Ruff, who's the harvest management biologist for the Swinomish Indian Tribe. And they will give uh, the management context. And then um, James Dixon uh, from NIMPS, National Marine Fisheries Service, West Coast Region, will speak to other aspects. So as I say, sort of, you know, pieces of sound and beyond. Um, Pacific Salmon Treaty, PFMC, uh, acronyms, gotta be careful of that, Pacific Fishery Management Council, <laughs> and, uh, and Puget Sound itself. I'll just say that uh, working together, and I would also like to point out that Garrett Rawls of Upper Skagit Tribe has also contributed to this. And uh, Casey's gonna be doing the heavy lifting and the major presentation today. And myself and Garrett uh, may come in at appropriate times, but uh, Casey's gonna be doing the, uh, the majority of the presentation. So I'll turn it over to Casey at this point. Okay. So as the title alludes to Skagit Salmon Management 101, I, the way kind of we understood this presentation that it would just, we would take this opportunity to kind of provide a, a general overview to the group of the various Skagit salmon stocks that that are, are present within the Skagit River system, um, and then the regulatory frameworks and the management processes that, that uh, occur on an annual, regular basis. So the, really the key questions that we're kind of hoping that we can answer with the presentation are, so, so first, what are the Skagit salmon populations and their basic ecological differences, uh, which influence their status and how they are managed by humans? And then the second is providing a general overview of the regulatory framework 
framework, various regulatory frameworks um, that are in place to help us manage Skagit salmon and actually Puget Sound salmon stocks in general. And uh, John mentioned that James, you know, so James Dixon is here with us today. So I'm going to give this general presentation. And I think, you know, James has the knowledge um, based on his, his position within NOAA to provide quite a few more details on the nuts and bolts of the, the regulatory frameworks that are in place um, and NOAA's role in all that. Uh, if we have time, James can provide his presentation or we can just go right into questions and James can really answer detailed questions that people might have. So just to kind of walk you through where we're going to go today with the presentation, I'll start with a just general just general summary of the Skagit, of Skagit salmon populations. I'll touch briefly on them on the management frameworks that exist that are in place to help manage harvest of Skagit salmon. Within that, I'll include the, the geographic and legal jurisdictions of those frameworks. I'll talk about the kind of comprehensive collaborative data gathering that occurs on, a, on an annual basis, data gathering and sharing that's required for us to um, actively, adaptively manage uh, Skagit salmon populations. And then I'll I'll end with a uh, an example an example specific to Skagit Chinook, and and how we how we utilize all of the available mon data that are that are generated from comprehensive monitoring programs that are in place to set uh, management objectives and to to effectively manage Skagit Chinook. Okay, so I just I actually thought I I would kind of start with. Chinook salmon life cycle it's from freshwater rearing to the estuary to near shore rearing, and then all the way to ocean, open ocean rearing and maturation back to back to spawning. And I, I put this up there just to just to illustrate the complexity of the salmon life cycle because every anadromous population that we have within the Skagit relies on both freshwater and marine um, and the ocean for or aspects of the ocean for some aspect or component of their of their life cycle um, and this really you know there this this complexity really has an effect on the overall complex migratory pathways that salmon take once they reach the ocean Mi migratory pathways can be species dependent well, here i'm just showing kind of a general map of the north pacific with a bunch of random mi migratory paths that illustrate the complexity of salmon migration and the fact that you know salmon cross international boundaries and our salmon originating from the Skagit and Puget Sound in general are, are of course harvested in Alaska and Canada. And similarly, we obviously harvest Canadian fish. You know, I'm illustrating the three primary regulatory frameworks that are in place that we we basically have to follow limit harvest impacts on um, salmon stock. So starting with our international agreement, which is the Pacific Salmon Treaty. The, these are typically 10 year agreements between um, the Southern US, Alaska, and Canada that allow us to set limits on harvest that can occur. You know, primarily there's a, there's a Chinook annex, a Coho annex, and then there are Chum and Sockeye annexes, annexes associated with the treaty. I won't go super into detail because it would take a lot of time. Uh, describing the various annexes, but just just indicating that this this Pacific Salmon Treaty is really in place to to ensure that more fish are able to return to the southern U.S. for both fisheries and and to achieve spawning um, objectives. And then once we get into kind of southern U.S. waters, we've got these two interplaying processes. So we've got the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, which kind of feeds into our North the Falcon process that we participate on an annual basis and it really is our annual harvest planning process that you know of course we rely on pre-season abundance forecasts that we use to plan fisheries and then ultimately you know I think James James can can go more into more into this but as far as NOAA's role in adopting our annual fisheries plan um, and then of course we've got our USV Washington case law that, that basically allows uh, co-management authority between the tribes and the state of Washington. So I apologize in advance for kind of uh, this busy table. I couldn't really figure out a better way to summarize the Skagit salmon populations and just kind of their key 
kind of key key aspects that we really want to touch upon, which is just general juvenile rearing ecology, outmigration, maturation schedules, harvest management strategy, and then just general geographic legal jurisdiction. And I think the, the point of this slide is to really just kind of drive home the point that we've got six different species of anadromous salmon and steelhead that, that return to uh, the Skagit to spawn. And each one of those species exhibits uh, differing uh, life history strategies. And, and ultimately that affects how the overall management strategy that we have to, as far as harvest and uh, salmon recovery. And ultimately that obviously affects where, where and when those fish can be caught. And so, you know, as an example, highlighting our ESA, our ESA stocks, you know, of course we have Chinook, um, six distinct populations of Chinook that, that return to spawn in the Skagit River. So we have three summer fall populations and three spring populations. Of course, you know, uh, we've got Eric Beamer on the call and he, he could easily spend the majority of this talk kind of talking about the, the intricacies of Chinook life history in the Skagit. Like here, I'm just kind of showing the variety of habitats that are be, that Chinook within the Skagit utilize for their, for their rearing strategies. Because these, these fish are ESA listed, there are no direct fisheries targeting wild Skagit Chinook, but we do have a vibrant, a, a productive hatchery spring Chinook run that we're able to implement fisheries on. And so we rely on basically an aggregate hatchery natural origin management strategy that's implemented within the constraints of the Endangered Species Act. So, so in any event, I just, I really wanted to just have this table just to highlight the species specific differences in these main categories here. And then just, just to kind of give you some general ranges in smolt production and adult returns for each of the species across species, there's quite a, quite a range in just overall smolt production and then resulting adult returns across the six populations. And again, just this table is really just to show that there's, there's a lot of variation across species within the Skagit. And then that's good, that ultimately affects how how we implement our management for, for these species in, in, in accordance with uh, harvest management and salmon recovery goals. Um, and ultimately, I, I will say that any fishery that has any sort of impact on an ESA listed species has to be incorporated in our annual fishing plan. So that includes North of Falcon, any, any fishery that has a uh, potential to impact ESA listed Chinook has to be accounted for in our preseason harvest planning process. Moving on to management frameworks and geographical, geographic and legal jurisdictions. I mentioned we implement an annual fishery planning process. So that is basically, you know, north of Falcon, PFMC, as well, actually, as well as the Pacific Salmon Treaty. You can kind of think of all three of those things as our, you know, so the, the north of Falcon PFMC is our domestic process, uh, southern U.S. planning process. That, that is basically implemented concurrent with the Pacific, Pacific Salmon Commission meetings uh, where international agreements are, are discussed and agreed to in accordance with the Pacific Salmon Treaty. And ultimately, all of this relies on timely, uh, so, so first a robust monitoring and data collection program, and, and of course, timely sharing of information. So I've got an example of of the data that are kind of routinely collected and shared. These are, of course, important examples of data that we use to assess abundance, to generate preseason forecasts. We, of course, share this, share a lot of this information, particular code of wire tag data with Alaska and Canada, where the uh, those information are used to generate coastwide abundance indices that are used to set fisheries impacts in northern fisheries. Um, so ultimately, impacts of all fisheries coastwide are, are indeed accounted for um, from Alaska to California through this preseason planning process. Again, it's within the realm of existing data collection programs allow. So for Chinook and Coho, I would say because we have coastwide code of wire tag programs in place, those would be our most uh, data rich programs, which we can actually use to make projections preseason of 
stock specific impacts in individual fishery based on because we have the code aware attack data and the modeling tools to to uh, make those projections. And so I mentioned the North of Falcon process. So that's really the our domestic planning process that the tribes and the state of Washington are engaged in to uh, plan plan fisheries in accordance with the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. So it's really the, the series of meetings where, you know, I mean, if you, you could kind of think of it as a, it's really an iterative process where the co-managers use all the available information, you know, stock specific information to generate pre-season abundance forecasts for individual stocks. That information is then shared. Um, individual co-managers develop their suite of planned fisheries that they're that they intend to implement based on the forecasted abundance and allowable impacts. And then ultimately it's ultimately is this it's this iterative process where fisheries have to be structured so that fisheries are implemented in accordance with ESA guidelines. So a, a primary example of that is um, and I'm going to get into that more in detail when I talk about the Skagit Chinook example, but we have low abundance thresholds for, for each Skagit Chinook management unit that are biologically based. So when I say biologically based, they're based on um, the escapement that would produce maximum sustainable yield. And ultimately, we don't treat that as a target. We treat that as an abundance estimate that we hope to exceed most of the time, if not all of the time. And fisheries are planned such that we need to, uh, that the populations for each of the management units exceed those values. So that's what I say, you know, fisheries are planned in accordance with ESA. What I mean when I say fisheries are planned in accordance with ESA guidelines. So, okay, so here's the, this is kind of the iterative process that I mentioned before. So for, we forecast the abundance of, of each stock. We determine if there's harvestable surplus. The state and tribe propose, propose fisheries to, to predict harvest. And then fisheries are modeled to determine which stocks are a conservation concern. And then we, you know, I mentioned the modeling tool that we use. We can use the fisheries regulation and assessment model, the FRAM model, um, that requires stock specific inputs of abundance and then harvest to project stock specific impacts. And then ultimately we negotiate, we continue negotiating until during the preseason process such that fisheries are planned in accordance with ESA guidelines. And so this is just a just a summary of, of, of the Endangered Species Act. The, the salmon species of concern in the Skagit are Chinook and Steelhead. But of course, in, in um, recent years, we've, we've had Southern resident orcas become highlighted, especially when it comes to prey availability of, of their preferred prey, which is Chinook salmon. You've got, you've got a lot to uh, consider when it comes to uh, planning fisheries that are resulting in take of ESA listed Chinook salmon or ESA, ESA listed salmon. NOAA's role is really to review and ultimately approve um, state and tribal salmon fisheries. Um, they provide us the permit, the tribes and the state the permit to, to implement their annual fishing plan. Or just, you know, I mentioned that data collection is really an important component of all this. With all of our management, um, we're not to the best of our ability, we're not, um, we're definitely not flying blind. Um, we're, we're implementing both at the, the tribal, state, federal, you know, there's various organizations that are, that are engaged in implementing collaborative research and monitoring of Puget Sound salmon stocks and in, in particular in the, in the Skagit. I, I'm, just, I'm just providing you this example of the Chinook salmon life cycle again, and just kind of walking through the various components of uh, life stage specific monitoring that's that's being implemented in the Skagit. This is a Chinook example, but ultimately for all of our species, the goal is, and I think we're mostly implementing it, is to is to monitor all life stages when 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 feasible. So we're trying to partition both freshwater and in the case of Chinook, freshwater estuary and marine life stages where possible. So trying to highlight which agencies are currently involved with collecting which which data types. So we've got juvenile spawning adults. Um, you know, so again, this is largely at this point in time our co-manager led efforts, but of course, I think we've got the salmon enhancement group that are involved in helping with spawning ground surveys and monitoring. SRSEs got an ongoing estuarine monitoring program, salmon monitoring program in, in the estuary and the near shore. And, and of course, there's collaborations with NOAA, federal agencies, 
And then, you know, when we talk about adults, it's a coast, you know, for, especially as it relates to coho and Chinook salmon, it's really a coastwide monitoring program that's in place because of international, the international agreement, uh, agreements to the Pacific Salmon Treaty. And so kind of keeping in mind salmon life, you know, life stage specific monitoring and in, in accordance with the salmon life cycle, trying to partition kind of import the key components of the salmon life cycle into freshwater and marine life stages. Ultimately, you know, we're collecting that information because, you know, it's not, it's not just about trying to keep track of, of harvest. And of course, that's really important. We're, we're, we're engaged in, in, in that sort of monitoring on an annual basis. In fact, we're required to. But this, this monitoring is structured such that it allows us to the best of our ability to assess the status of each of, each of the populations. So, so for instance, you know, by partitioning out freshwater and marine life stages, we're able to, to assess whether there are, for instance, long-term trends in um, declining or increasing trends in freshwater survival or marine survival. And then ultimately, we're utilizing this information to assess um, the effectiveness of, of salmon recovery efforts. Ultimately, I think, you know, there's going to be some future presentations in this series that are going to go into that in more detail. But I wanted to just kind of introduce the concept of of, of density dependence here. And so when we think about a, the salmon life cycle, um, you know, an individual spawning event produces the next generation of adult recruits that ultimately are going to return to spawn. And that relationship is really limited by the availability of spawning and rearing habitat. And so, so in the case of a, of a, of a relationship where that there's really no no habitat limit on the relationship between spawners and adult recruits. We would expect this linear relationship. Basically, there'd be no no limit. But in reality, this is this is what we see as the habitat fills up. We basically see productivity or the number of adult recruits produced per spawner begin to, to decline. And so eventually, we reach a point as the habitat fills up. Of the, you know, we basically as the habitat becomes fully seeded. Beyond uh, with spawners and, and um, juvenile salmon, ultimately we reach a point of diminishing returns where more spawners doesn't necessarily equate to more, more fish returning um, in future generations. This is, this is an example of a single stage life cycle analysis, so adult model. But then I mentioned trying to, trying to partition out freshwater and marine life stages. And so Again, if we, you know, we we have monitoring in place in the Skagit River because we have a mean stem smolt trap that allows us to, to estimate smolt production for um, a number of species, including Chinook and Chum salmon, that allows us to estimate the relationship between uh, river smolts and estuarine uh, rearing migrants. This is more of a Chinook example. As the estuary habitat gets filled up with increasing smolts, we begin to see decline in that the productivity or at least that that life stage transition from from river smolts to estuarine marine migrants so i should say now that managers aren't trying to harvest more fish the goal is to to try to provide some opportunity for fisheries but the ultimate goal is to fully seed the available habitat to you know based on based on our current understanding of these relationships for all of our salmon stocks so Ultimately, the goal is to fully see available habitat. And the goal of salmon recovery, of course, is to add more freshwater and juvenile rearing habitat to increase productivity so that we're basically increasing capacity, increasing productivity for all of our salmon stocks. Touched upon data collection. So, you know, our annual data needs are escapement, catch impacts, ages, stock origin, which is, you know, a combination of generated from quota wire tags and genetics. We implement test fisheries in the main stem Skagit. And of course, this data is shared um, on, a, on a regular basis between co-managers and then our federal trustees. Sport fisheries are monitored. The WDFW has, has over the years has really developed cutting edge methods for improved monitoring of their sport fisheries. Their steelhead fishery is a good example of that, where they kind of pulled in some um, some expertise from the Columbia River to, to really improve how they monitor and estimate it impacts in season in their in-river sport fisheries. And so I'd say that's a really good example of collaboration between WFW and the tribes 
on in-season management. And then I mentioned the, the tribes have test fisheries that we use to in, in that are implemented at various index reaches in the main stem Skagit to assess run strength and annual changes in run timing, phenology, various aspects of salmon phenology and whatnot. And for a number of species, these test fisheries have proven extremely useful for, for being able to make changes, adaptive changes in season, whether it means reducing fisheries or at allowing increased opportunity based on based on new information that suggests a much stronger run size. And then I mentioned, you know, I already mentioned the krill surveys that the state is that WDFW is implementing, but they're also implementing um, really, really very rigorous test fisheries in mark selective uh, mixed stock fishing areas that allow for estimates of encounters by by legal mark, legal unmarked, sublegal mark, sublegal unmarked categories. You know, these are important in the FRAM model that allow us to allow us to estimate stock specific impacts in some of these mixed stock fishing areas. And so the state does keep a pretty tight, um, they, they monitor those fisheries in season and make in season management adjustments based on what they're seeing in season in those fisheries in as timely a manner as, as possible. I thought I said I would go over kind of use Skagit Chinook as, a, as an example, got a lot of data to help us manage Skagit Chinook um, based on ongoing monitoring um, within, within the basin as well as coastwide. Kind of going back to that, dent, that spawn and recruit relationship, we rely on estimating the relationship between spawners and, and, and adult recruitment to ultimately evaluate and estimate these important parameters, including intrinsic productivity. So you could think of intrinsic productivity, again, as this part of the curve, um, and then ultimately carrying capacity, which is basically where the point at which the number of spawners beyond which the population fails to replace itself. And we use, we rely on this, this relationship ultimately to one, derive um, our, our management reference points. So that includes escapement goals, and exploitation rate ceilings that effectively limit harvest on Skagit Chinook um, management units. And we, we, we conducted this analysis and assessment for each of our management units. And, and ultimately, these are the uh, management reference, reference points that we use. They're biologically based, based on our assess, the assessed relationship between spawners and adult recruitment. And this basically limits annual harvest on Skagit Chinook on an annual basis. So these ultimately guide management of Skagit Chinook on an annual basis. And so fisheries are managed, in large part, they're managed to exceed these low abundance thresholds on an annual basis. Um, and then also not to exceed, not to exceed the exploitation rate ceilings on each of these. So these exploitation rate ceilings are set such that, for such that each management unit would exceed their their low abundance threshold, which is in this case is the the estimate of MSY escapement or the escapement that produces maximum sustainable yield 80% or more of the time. You know, let's just say we have a forecast for summer fall Chinook of 13,825. We would be able to implement up to a 52% total allowable exploitation rate. However, I will say that that exploitation rate is rarely, rarely met because again, it's a ceiling. It's not a target. The co-managers don't use that as a target. It's really just a, it's a, it's a, it's a guidance ceiling that fisheries can be implemented so as not to exceed that value. And so just generally speaking, these are kind of the three, each, each of the management units, spring, spring Chinook, summer, fall Chinook, and just kind of looking at overall long-term trends and escapement for each each of the six populations or each of the three populations within, within each management unit. And you can see, I mean, with the exception of Swaddle and Upper Sox Spring Chinook that have exhibited um, recent year increasing trends in, in escapement. Generally speaking, the, the remaining populations have, haven't really exhibited any, any clear long-term trend um, over at least since 2010. And I you know I mentioned we use the fisheries regulation and assessment model, the FRAM model, and which relies on uh, code of wire tag data to estimate stock specific impacts in individual fisheries. To ultimately, what we can do is we can we can we can run this model post season with that includes actual observed abundances and in fisheries that occurred 
to estimate, to generate a postseason um, estimate of harvest impacts that actually occurred uh, during, during the fishing year. So this represents the, the, the postseason assessment of, of actual fishing, uh, fishing impacts, exploitation rate that occurred uh, on each of the each of the management units, and it's broke actually broken out by kind of general geographic area: northern, pre-terminal, southern U.S., and terminal southern U.S. Terminal southern U.S. is in the Skagit River, and then pre-terminal southern U.S. would be marine waters outside of Skagit Bay, basically. Um, and then northern is, includes Canada and Alaska. But you can basically see that for Skagit Spring Chinook, uh, you know, since 1992, we only exceeded the exploitation rate ceiling in two years out of that time frame, And then for Skagit summer fall Chinook, uh, we exceeded that the exploitation rate ceiling of 52% in five, five years out of that entire time frame. And then the large part, actually, the most plausible reason for why that typically occurs is typically a forecast will be generated such that the population is, is projected to come in higher than what is actually observed. And so uh, we can actually kind of Use, use the FRAM model and the code of wire tag data to kind of focus specifically on where impacts are specifically occurring. And this slide just represents the distribution. So of the total average fishery AQ mortality by AQ I mean adult equivalent mortality. Um, so that's immature fish. So AQ equivalents, we account for that because immature fish are impacted by fisheries, but not all the fish would have returned to spawn. So we apply natural mortality rates to those to those values to, to arrive at these AQ values. So this represents the distribution of total AQ um, abundance, so adult ocean abundance of fish on an annual basis that return to spawn and then that are caught in fisheries. And kind of basically what you can see is that you know over 50% in general of fish you know return to the spawning grounds and the vast majority of the time. That represents well in excess of the low abundance threshold for each Skagit Chinook management unit. And then uh, of the harvest, Alaska and Canada make up 26% of the distribution. And then the remainder is, you know, freshwater net and southern U.S. Um, impacts, which, which make up about 18% of the distribution. And then you can even get it more into the details of the southern U.S. impacts that are not freshwater net, what kind of what the makeup is. I think one of the take-home messages from this is that, you know, to the best of our ability, we're attempting to account for all fisheries-related impacts as they relate to gadget and salmon. So in summary, I wanted to go over kind of key aspects of what I've just covered, which is harvest management of Skagit salmon stocks is really a data-driven process that does rely on coordinated efforts among various tribes, state, federal um, agencies to ultimately land on of annual fishing package that is not going to adversely affect ESA listed gadgets tonight. Um, and then this, you know, the same goes for outside of ESA. We're also basically implementing the same iterative process for coho and chum and sockeye and all of our salmon stocks where there's potentially potential for harvest. The take home message here is that there's really no fishery that gets a free pass when it comes to trying to assign impacts um, to, of a particular fishery on, on Skagit salmon stocks. And so to the best of our ability, we're taking into account all sources of fishery impacts. And um, when it comes to developing the annual harvest plans, we're doing, doing the best we can um, at this point in time with all the available information to manage our salmon stocks in a responsible, sustainable way. Thanks, Casey. Well done. And James, I'd like to add something. Oh. Yeah, this is Grant Kirby with Sox to Adel Tribe. Oh, okay, sure, Grant. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, the big takeaway message here is that we micromanage our fisheries due to North of Helkin obligations, Pacific Salmon Treaty obligations, and Endangered Species Act obligations. And I know some of those percentages can be confusing to some people. That 52% on summer, uh, fall Chinook that's a harvest rate for all fisheries from Alaska down. Now, there are other triggers. If we don't meet a low abundance threshold at 7,000 plus that uh, Casey mentioned, we, uh, it triggers uh, exploitation rate of 15 to 17 
percent in southern fisheries. The other takeaway there on that is that we haven't had a direct. This is all sh in the terminal area. This is all Chinook bycatch and other fisheries mm -hmm. that is contributing to that uh, harvest rate ceiling. We don't trigger a directed fishery or even consider triggering one until we reach that an abundance comes in at that upper management threshold, which in the case of the Skagit for summer falls is 14,500. Right. No. Yeah, I just thought I'd add that. Yeah, no, that thanks, sense. Grant. That, that's good. Just so everybody knows, north of Falcon, that's a point of land on the coast. <laughs> and yeah. we go north of that to manage it. So oh. it's just, we you know, chop, chop up the West Coast for management purposes. But James, you got the floor. There's there's uh, four tribes in the watershed and three with treaty rights. And I just wanted to, um, you know, thank them and uh, NOAA and DFW for, for being here for um, sharing their information. So I just wanted to recognize, you know, Sock Swaddle and uh, Upper Skagit and, and Swinomish as a uh, treaty tribe uh, with fisheries rights and, uh, you know, part of the co-management process. And I think they've worked together to some degree on this, but if there's any, you know, comments, we're open to uh, hearing from everybody on that. So just wanted Good to share that. Good point. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Good point. Is the research that's been done by the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project in, incorporated into this data collection and, and analysis that has been described? Uh, yes, it, generally speaking, yes. I mean, you know, I would say that our our data collection, uh, data collection, um, um, and re various research ongoing research programs, the data collected from those were utilized by the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project to, you know, for the, the various applications and various questions that were uh, being sought uh, to answer. So whether it be assessing long-term trends in marine survival, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, I think, you know, I, I see jocks on the, on the, on the call, but, it, you know, I think uh, there's, there's obviously a lot of applications, a lot of questions that that project sought to answer and relied on a lot of data collected by a lot of different um, tribal, state, federal agencies. So yes. This is Eric Beamer. I, this talk, the first talk in this Science Summit series is about explaining the nuts and bolts of salmon management of which data are needed. Um, hopefully the audience saw from Casey's presentation that there's you know, data accounted for the legal and geographic frameworks, use that data in a, in a transparent decision-making process that I heard Bob tell me that no one is satisfied. <laughs> no one likes the answers because it's a, it, it, you know, an, everyone has their, their special interest. But anyway, it ha we have this framework to make decisions. But Gary's question is a really good question. The Salish Sea Marine Survival Project looked at what are the causes of decline, apparent decline of different salmon populations in the Salish Sea. And then by inference, and in some cases, maybe experimentation, what you could do about them to make things better. So that's a research project that if you find out new information that could be inserted into management, you might be able to have better forecasting models or those sorts of things, but more likely, and in a lot of cases, the, the findings are saying, you know, you should do these actions to improve the population status. So there's a distinction between the management sausage grinding decision-making framework versus what are the human actions that would make the population status better. They're, they work together, but they're, they are separate things. So later on in the Science Summit, we'll talk about some of the actions that are being done in the Skagit that are meant to make the populations better. Um, but all of it uses the same management framework that, that Casey described that happens year after year after year. And even things like whether or not to use sonar for adult return assessment, that's really, those are things that would make the data better. You know, we have, it could be many, many talks about. Uh, Amy's first question, 
as we focus on data collection as an important research and cons consequently management piece, is there any plan to use sonar systems such as ARIES from sound metrics in the Skagit River to actually determine the quantity of fish returning to our river? The use of sonar has been discussed for a long time uh, on the Skagit River at various levels. Uh, the newest iteration of sonar that's been popular in, in uh, riverine applications is the acoustic camera. It seems fairly straightforward in its application, but as somebody who worked in the sonar arena for about 15 years uh, myself, and looked at all different kinds of sonar, it's not quite as simple as it seems. Um, simple purchase of equipment, maybe $100,000. Good software is an additional $40,000, $50,000. And then you've got installation and maintenance. But the real kicker comes in when you try to do analysis. One of the, the large questions is, how do you speciate? Um, you know, how do you know what fish is, is out there 80 meters into the channel? And especially if it's with eight, 10, 15, 100 other fish, um, it's, it's quite a process uh, and we're excited about the opportunity to use it. Uh, the logistics and the manpower are, are the main constraints at the present time. But yeah, if somebody's got a million dollars that they'd like to put into the program, we can certainly move that implementation schedule up. But uh, yeah, we are aware of it and we're, we're hoping that someday soon we'll be able to implement it. If you wanna see an example of the complexity of the system, go to the, uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada and look at their, their mission uh, station. They use a combination of different sonars up there and they have full-time staff, boats, everything else that run that system. And it's, it's pretty complex and impressive. Peter. Thank you, Casey, that was great. I really appreciated it. Uh, are we getting accurate reporting from both Canada and the US in terms of uh, sport and commercial catch? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So, uh... For the, for the most part, I would say, I think, I mean, each, each entity has a, has a legally binding obligation. Well, I guess James, James could actually yeah. like James, James, this would be actually a really good one for James, but you know, ultimately I will, one thing I, I do want to add is that um, there, there are situations where, um, you know, for instance, in, 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 you know, in evaluating, um, all of the inputs that are in our, in in the models, you know, like here's here's a Chinook example where we where we're evaluating all the inputs in in our Chinook model, um, uh, all of the all the different harvest components. We we will um, you know catch instances where Canadian you know that's missing instances where Canadian sport catch, for instance, is missing from 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 our database and. And we'll have to work with Canada to, to track those those estimates down and and generate reliable estimates so that we can actually um, account for that missing catch. And and in general, you know, although it's taken a bunch of extra work, Canada's been pretty pretty good about about um, complying with 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 those sorts of um, collaborations. So, um, James, do you want to add yeah. anything or? No, I, I mean, I think you, you generally covered it. Yeah, it's, I guess folks, good context for folks is, you know, this is a, a, it's a, it's an evolving process. It's a continually evolving process since it was implemented first in 1985 and through the various um, uh, renewals and extensions of the, the annexes that Casey referred to, Chinook, Coho, and the other uh, species. So, I mean, the, the, even the information used, for instance, the coded wire tag program has had um, expansions, uh, probably generally has been expanded since the early years and new stocks and uh, fisheries, uh, new fisheries in some cases have come online 
and sampling programs have been implemented to make sure that there's representative sampling to recover those. I think um, like Casey just pointed out a, an example of how the, the constant and perpetual review of these things and review of the models and review of the data sets that go into them often does uh, result in uh, the realization and agreement that uh, there wasn't an accurate capturing of a certain fishery and that's fixed and then we move forward <laughs> so it's um it's there's no uh, there's no finish line in this sense but it's uh it's uh, constantly uh, reviewed and and uh, altered for the better for more accuracy as we move forward thank you Bull. Hey, hey james um richard had to put in a question that was similar to mine in, in the context. Could you sort of speak to, like you said, the specific salmon treaty has been out there a while. How has it, how has it progressed over time in sort of yeah, sure, improving sure. our management and, I, and our accounting? Yeah, I um, and I don't actually have a specific slide uh, that answers this question. I can I can just try to give you an answer. So, like I said, the the first uh, uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty was initiated in 1985. And um, uh, it has uh, generally uh, been updated um, uh, every 10 years, uh, a new uh, annex or a new agreement. Uh, sometimes it's the entirety of all, you know, all species. Sometimes it's a specific chapter like the Chinook chapter, the Coho chapter. But um, so post 85, uh, we had things like the Endangered Species Act listings in the Southern states. And obviously Canada has a, uh, they have their own um, SARA, I think, uh, Species at Risk Act. That's a similar uh, type of act. And so, um, as as the ten year chapter renewals and renegotiations have taken place, uh, what started as uh, a more more general guidelines and abundance based uh, fishery regimes um, uh, gave way to. Uh, uh, stock specific objectives in say the Chinook chapter. So in the 1999 uh, renewal, uh, the, the element was added to split the northern fisheries into two categories of fisheries. I'm going to, this is where acronym suit <laughs> gets in, but um, and they're uh, AABM fisheries, uh, adult uh, aggregate adult based management and ISBM, which is individual stock based management. And that was the first uh, real break apart where, um, at least for index stocks that occur in the lower uh, states, and those are you know, thought to represent uh, the different run timings, the different uh, regions of the sound where uh, the stocks uh, have more similar migration patterns, mature maturation rates and migration um, uh, timings. So North Sound versus South Sound versus say the Straits. And so uh, that's the first, in 99, that was the first time where uh, we had uh, specific call outs or limits to, uh, agreed to limits to fishery impacts in total uh, for, for those specific index stocks. And then since that time, there's been two, uh, two additional uh, renewals of the Chinook chapter. And those, uh, the, the number of stocks has expanded that are represented and the rates, uh, the, the rate limits have come down. Uh, so so uh, in the last two successive renewals, uh, the Northern fishery rates have been reduced. I believe in 2009, there was a 30% reduction for the ISBM fisheries for Canada and a 15% reduction uh, for Southeast Alaska. And then in this, la this last uh, version in 2019, there was an additional 12.5% reduction to the Canadian ISBM fisheries and, a seven, and an additional 7.5% for the Southeast Alaska fisheries. So there's been um, uh, both tighter, uh, tighter management, stock-specific management, and reduction in, in allowable rates. Well, John, there's kind of a tough one in the... Um on the uh, paper here. Can I read it? And sure, see, go ahead. <laughs> go. So great numbers on returning, but I think another column showing how they relate to the TRT targets. That's the technical oh. recovery team. Is that right in the in the recovery plan? So the, our recovery goals. 
So it appears we are just running to manage at the current populations and just focus on meeting a base population to prevent extinction. Casey didn't really touch on how the management process is trying to increase the population to meet TRT goals. Once again, making me think the population is already there, so why do we need any more habitat improvements? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, ultimately, you know, we, we update, so um, our, our harvest plan, our Chinook, in particular Chinook, our Chinook harvest management plan, our, you know, we just submitted a, uh, an updated plan to, to NOAA for, for their review. And that, that the, the idea is that it potentially is gonna be a 10 year plan. And then as a uh, as part of that process, we had to go through an overhaul and update all of our analyses and assessment of current abund our, our assessment of management reference points. So that you know that includes escapement goals and exploitation rate ceilings based on current estimates of abundance and productivity and availability of habitat. And so all of our harvest management metrics. So when I say metrics, right, I'm kind of using management reference points synonymously with metrics. Um, take into account the availability of his existing habitat. So when I, when I went and showed you guys the, the relationship between spawners or group, the derived relationship, we're, that's, that's basically our most, you know, we would consider that the best available, current best available science on abundance and productivity and, you know, our estimates of population dynamics, you, um, you know, the, the most, current available information and we use that information to to set harvest limits on escapement goals and harvest limits and so in re in reference to the question about uh why are we in, uh, about whether we're managing you know for like a static abundance that's not what we're doing we're not managing for a static escapement we're managing we're setting fisheries to exceed that value 80 percent of the or more of the time that's kind of the, de the definition <clears throat> The NOAA's kind of NOAA's Jeopardy criterion. I, I guess James James is on the call, so he can he can he can chime in if he wants to. But um, we, you know, NOAA has a a, a a a criteria that they use to evaluate um, uh, harvest objectives or management reference points, and it's really the goal of their assessment. Is the goal of any 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 harvest that that um, of fisheries that have the potential to harvest ESA listed stocks is to not have, uh, is to not um, impede recovery. And so fisheries are being implemented with consistent with that, um, with, with that process. And, and we have to provide all of the science and the analyses to support, um, to support our, our management objectives associated with, with, with the fisheries. So kind of a long winded answer, but we'll do that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind people that when we're talking about salmon management, we're talking about three different abundance levels. As Casey uh, pointed out, right now, when we're talking about harvest management, we're talking about harvest management at current levels, that at current abundance levels, population levels, that do not impede the recovery of listed species, or for that matter, recovery of other species which aren't yet listed. The second one is a recovery level of abundance that we would like to achieve so that we can be delisted for those listed species. Mm -hmm. Yet a higher level is a recovery level to meet the co-manager's needs. The co-manager needs in general, are higher than current abundance levels, and they're higher than recovery levels for delisting from ESA. So when we're talking about management, we're managing for three different goals, each one larger than the other. And at the same time, we're trying to, to maintain some level of harvest to meet treaty goals and treaty obligations. And those are for tribes and the state because we're all co-managers under the treaty. 
Yeah, they, I think Bob Bob did uh, touch on a couple of things I wanted to, but additionally, I guess I'd say specific to the questions about the TRT targets. Um, and I assume maybe uh, the, the person's uh, referring to the, the recovery planning targets for, for some of those. And um, so I think this the, the idea that um, there could be a, a, a scenario, for instance, where there was was no allowed harvest on a run of fish. Let's you know use one of the uh, Skagit management Chinook management units as an example. Um, and on average, uh, that uh, that would still produce run sizes that are well below uh, what's identified for recovery in the in the recovery plan. And that's simply because as Casey was pointing out in his density dependent um, section that there's not there's not uh, the capacity or the productivity at, uh, at various capacities available currently. So, um, so, so the question about the question is not as much, you know, why would you continue to do habitat recovery uh, if if this management uh, framework is in place? It's recognizing that the reason you must continue to do <laughs> habitat work is because the historical capacity of the system has been diminished so much that um, that there's no way to currently reach those recovery objectives uh, given the given the capacity and quality of, of the existing habitat. So it's it's uh, um, it's it's. Not a diminishing return, I think, is the, the way I see the question framed up. Um, it's a it's a net benefit, in, including to harvest. So our monitoring framework and the analytical framework that we apply to all of our data to to develop or to uh, evaluate, you know, population abundance and productivity, and then ultimately derive um, the the uh, management reference points for for Skagit Chinook. That that can be as more data becomes available, as more information becomes available, that that those the, those analyses can be rerun and our management reference points can be updated based on the new information. So for instance, as salmon recovery proceeds, um, you know, salmon recovery efforts proceed. So as, as you know, uh, new estuarine and floodplain varying habitat become available and, and, and increase the um, capacity, rearing capacity of the system, Theoretically, we would we would we would see that in our um, in our overall um, uh, modeling and analysis to evaluate when we when we go to evaluate population status, um, and theoretically that would that would result in changes to our management objectives or our management reference points. So that includes abundance based thresholds and managed and and um, exploitation rate ceilings. So. Just, I'm just adding that in to say that you know this is adapt. This is all adaptive and can be reevaluated at any given time when as new information becomes available. And I mentioned that we're currently you know submitted a, um, a 10 year plan, um, but at any point we can evaluate um, you know the status of the population with the existing methods that we have. So. Uh, Amy put another question about the general health of the watershed and what kind of programs mm -hmm. are monitoring those, and so that's going to be. A topic for future meetings, so related to those habitat targets that we're starting to talk about now, and um, how we're doing in implementation and effectiveness of those actions. And so, there, I did put a link to a report um, that we have on our website uh, in our documents page called the 2020 Monitoring and Adaptive Management Report, which kind of compares those habitat conditions to habitat targets or desired future conditions, um, but we'll talk more about that in future meetings. Someone in the chat asked yeah. to um, make sure we answered the question that, you know, there's, uh, you know, in the, the rumor mill, you hear 80% of our fish are being caught in Canada or BC or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what we saw in Casey's presentation is speaking to Skagit Chinook specifically, about 55% of those in the, I don't know if that was a summary or a specific year are, are escaping to the rivers. 
to spawn, um, but then 26% uh, was BC and Alaska, and then the, the rest would be down here. And so, yeah, those are, those are 2009 to 2000, that's an average, 2009 to 2016 average, just to kind of summarize. And, you know, there's different ways to, to look at the data, but generally speaking, yeah, the, um, 80% is a, uh, that's a, that's not accurate. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd also just say another, another uh, common uh, confusion for folks is, is the, the difference between, uh, like Casey said, 80%, there's not a, there's not a Puget Sound stop from my understanding, especially during that reference period that has 80% of the fish caught or even 80 per, any more, 80% 80 of the harvested fish uh, strictly in Northern fishery. So yeah, it's the difference between the total fish, like the pie, the full pie that Casey, uh, that are actually harvested. So in the case of the, the, the summer fall, you know, it's um, less than 50% of the fish are harvested to begin with. And then of that part that's harvested, what percentage is, you know, in the northern fisheries or the southern fisheries, you can see it's, it's a, it's a relatively close split uh, between northern and southern U.S. fisheries in that management period, but, you know, each, each representing, you know, roughly a quarter of the total adult abundance, so. Um, and, yeah, and keep, I, yeah, thanks, James. I, I was just going to add, you know, keeping, keeping in mind, you know, the, that, that, that chart that I that I presented um, that kind of showed that 55% of total total AQ adult ocean abundance general in general on average makes it to the spawning grounds. If you know when we think about for instance salmon recovery actions that result in increased productivity and ultimately more fish, you know 55% of more fish means more right. fish <laughs> coming back to the spawning grounds. Exactly. So so that's you know ultimately you can think of salmon recovery. That's, you know, maybe, you know, maybe that, maybe the overall kind of general picture of the pie doesn't, doesn't change. But when we think about percentages, you know, in terms of, you know, the percent of fish that return overall total abundance that returns to spawn or the total number of fish that are harvested and whatnot, the, you know, more fish is more fish. So. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. You gotta, we gotta, we gotta remember yeah. that yeah. percentage yeah. rate is not yeah. total. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. Well, those are good, good points. The statistics, the statistics though that you're citing don't take account of other things that reduce the adult returning salmon number. So if whales eat more, that isn't in the chart as far as I can tell. Um, well, uh, could I, yeah, natural mortality though, I think Casey can speak to natural mortality is accounted for in France. And there's a sort of a yeah. point where, you know, other research can help inform that number. So Keith, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just going to say, you know, you brought up the brought up whales, Gary. I mean, ultimately, yeah, FRAM doesn't necessarily account for, um, you know, fish being, Chinook being, the number of Chinook being consumed by whales per se. Um, it's, we're, we're taking into account natural, other sources of natural mortality, um, um, in addition to harvest mortality. So that's what we mean when we say adult equivalence or AQ abundance or AQ mortality. Um, um, but ultimately, you know, we, we do, um, I was just going to add that we, uh, these, these, these tools allow us to, to, you know, they're kind of, at least at this point in time, our best understanding of really what's happening to allow us to, 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 to um, get a, a much better understanding of what's happening to our, our salmon stocks. Um, um, even, even if we're not accounting for, you know, the, the, the number of fish that are consumed by whales on an annual basis. So. Both sure. Sure. James Craft. So he yeah, asked how, how, how are the needs of all the other salmon and, and the other rivers of Puget Sound or outside of Puget Sound, you know, how are those taken into account? And I would say that, you know, the process that Casey talked about with regard to forecasting, uh, well, developing management objectives and conservation objectives, forecasting the gadget runs of the various species and planning fisheries, that's done in every watershed uh, in Puget Sound and outside of Puget Sound. 
And the North Falcon process is where all of those watershed plans, forecasts, uh, and uh, 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 I think prefer preferred or proposed fisheries come together. They get uh, eventually they all get moved into uh, single uh, full fram uh, model runs that uh, basically takes all those abundances makes uh, uh, at first uh, good assumptions about northern fisheries as the season preseason moves on it gets much better fine-tuned estimates of, of northern fisheries and runs them uh, for for a full year of planned fisheries and as uh, the results of those uh, come out and and we don't say one population is is a little over uh, over harvested relative to the goal then they go back they alter the fishery uh, they they bring that down. It's a bit of a you know it's a bit of a whack a mole during the preseason until you get to that point where everybody has a, a set of agreed to fisheries that meet all of the uh, harvest objectives. Yeah, um, and following up on the on the southern resident killer whale needs, okay. I I would I would tie it into this discussion that the the Fram model is actually a tool that's being used, not 100% properly, but it's being used by the um, Protected Resources Division of NOAA in their assessment of not only the abundance of Chinook that are available for the killer whales or the SRKWs, but also the timing of where those fish are, what the age composition of those fish are at that time in a location where they match it with their data of where killer whales might be feeding and the abundance of the killer whales. And so the work that we're doing in harvest assessment and harvest management and the tools we're using are also crossing over into SRKW concerns as far as forage goes. So there is a tie-in, there is a link, and we are in constant negotiations or constant discussions with the, with the SRKW folks on what their needs are and how we can all work together to meet all, um, everybody's needs, including SRKW. There you go. You know, I often, uh, I think we all uh, in the fishery management get questions about what, what defining north of falcon yeah. and i think you know you did a good job it is it is a reference to point or cape falcon which is in uh, the, on the north uh, north oregon coast um but you know the re it, I mean, it's not a the, the it's it's different from say the council process yeah. the pacific fishery management council in that it's uh it's a semi-formalized prod uh, process the north of falcon it's it was um I think it was in, I don't know if it was, I think it was instituted bef before uh, implementation of fully of the full decision, but it's definitely a product of that decision. And it's basically the uh, furthest southern extent uh, the, of fish migrating that come from the area under the, under the um, uh, US v. Washington and US v. Oregon case area. So. It, it, it basically um, it, it it provides the co-managers, so state of Washington in this case, and the and the treaty tribes, uh, the opportunity to plan their fisheries for the state waters. So Puget Sound is part of that, the coastal estuaries, and then obviously the Columbia River, and they they do it in parallel with the Pacific Fishery Management Council because there needs to be a a handshake, if you will, between the inside fisheries and the outside fisheries so that, like Casey alluded to earlier, we can make sure that the management objectives, including ESA limits, are, are met with the planned fisheries. So yep. just I you know, hope that's good added context. Good. Again, thanks to Casey and Bob and Garrett and James and Grant and others that have worked to put this together. Again, thank you for your time to doing this and thanks to everyone else for all the good questions.